I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and like most Canadians, I used to play a lot of sports. I played a lot of hockey, and I was on the road going to games and practices all the time, and I didn't really eat that healthy. I ate pretty normal. I grew up in a normal family, but we were eating at fast food all the time, and I would have stomach issues, especially when I got worried uh, or stressed out. I would have um, some anxiety, and I really felt that pit in the middle of your stomach, and I just thought that was normal. And as I got older and went through college and then went into medical school and residency, that stress level just continued to increase and the stomach issues got worse and worse. Uh, and I didn't really know why and I never really put two and two together until I met my now wife who is very holistic, very integrative and grew up in that world and she eats very healthy and cooks very healthy and I started eating her food and all of my symptoms completely went away. And that to me was just so interesting and it really made me start thinking about whether there could be some connection there. And then when I was working in residency in the hospital, there was this one case that really brought it all together for me. There was a 10 year old boy who I had seen multiple times in the hospital and he was coming in for a juvenile arthritis. They didn't know what was causing uh, the rash that he was getting and the arthritis, the swelling of the joints, and they just called it idiopathic. And every time I would go in the room, I would see that he had candy, snacks, chips all over the room, was always eating uh, unhealthy foods. And so one day when we were rounding and talking about the patient, I said to the team, hey, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe the diet that he has could be affecting uh, what the symptoms are, and especially because that's what I was going through at the same time and I was starting to put it together for myself. And everybody kind of just laughed it off and said, Haha, you know, that, that doesn't even make any sense and just kind of left it. And then the patient went home and then came back two weeks later and was admitted to the hospital again. And so he was back on my team. I was fortunate to still be taking care of him. And this time when I went into rounds, I did a little bit more research and I brought in a bunch of information about celiac disease, which is a gluten intolerance, and talked about that to the team and said, you know, maybe he doesn't have a wheat intolerance, a gluten intolerance, but look at the symptoms. They're very similar to someone that would have celiac. Maybe he has some sort of other sensitivity. Maybe there's something going on. And again, everyone just kind of laughed it off, said that was silly. There's probably nothing to do with that, and it kind of dropped there. But grandma of uh, the 10-year-old came to me after and said, you know, uh, Dr. Joel, I really love what you were saying. No one's really ever thought about the cause. We're just treating the symptoms, but no one's ever given us a thought about why this might be happening. Let me talk to mom and see if she'd be willing to come see you as a pediatrician. And so after this child left the hospital, they came to see me as a pediatrician and we worked on the diet. We took out uh, gluten and dairy. We took out all the sugar, uh, the snacks, the candy, uh, or most of it anyways. And we increased the exercise and we worked on his sleep and just those basic life skills, and he got better. He got completely better. He never went back to the hospital again in the two years I took care of him after that. And that to me was a light bulb moment because I, I just thought it was amazing. Something as simple as changing the diet led this child to have his life be changed. And when I was leaving, mom came to me and gave me a big hug and said, thank you for giving me my child back. And I don't feel like I did that much other than to do the basic simple life things, but this is something that is so common sense and everyone needs to be doing this and thinking about that. And at the end of the day, it was just those simple lifestyle factors. There's more to this. I need to go out and search and learn more and see what else there is to this because everybody needs to know about this. And I want to bring this into my practice and be an adjunct to just the regular conventional medicine, bring in that integrative side. I'm a conventional doctor and I love conventional medicine. We have the most unbelievable treatments that we never had in the past. We can cure cancer, we can keep someone alive who has HIV, we can do all these amazing things, and doctors are wonderful, amazing people, but medicine really has shifted to treating disease much more so than preventing it, and that's really where I think integrative medicine can mold in and is really helpful because there's more of a focus on that prevention side, and I think both are important. You need both things together, and that's the essence of integrative medicine is combining those two. I was conventionally trained uh, in the regular Western medical system, but then following that, I took it upon myself to learn a little bit of functional medicine, which looks more into the root cause, some homeopathy, Ayurveda, which is Indian medicine. And so in this practice, what I tried to do is blend those all together. My ethos and what I really believe in is that there shouldn't be 
Eastern medicine, Western medicine, functional medicine, homeopathy, it should just be medicine. You should just do whatever is best on that day for the patient and do whatever is least harm. That's the oath that we take. That's the Hippocratic oath. That's what goes back to the beginning of medicine. Hippocrates was the, the father of medicine and that's what he believed. He was always talking about food being medicine and doing the least harm. And so if there's another treatment modality or a way to even prevent something from happening, why not do it? If we can give a supplement instead of giving antibiotic, then that's good for everybody. And so that's really what I try to practice here is not to do the conventional medicine unless you really need it. Sometimes if you just have a little bit of an ear pain or a cough, you don't have to jump right to an antibiotic right away. There are other things that you can do and maybe they help, maybe they don't, but at least if you don't do the, the treatment, like an antibiotic or a steroid, then the child can have a chance for their body to rebalance because if you give something like an antibiotic, that also causes some harm sometimes. You're not just killing the bad, it's called antibiotic, it's against life. So that's what the definition is. And so you might be killing some of the good bacteria too. And it doesn't mean that we don't need it sometimes, but we jump to it, I think, too quickly in conventional medicine. And so that's really where I'm trying to balance those two sides. In general, I try to avoid antibiotics as often as possible. And often it will be, you give them, you might give them a prescription and say, maybe you don't need this for a couple days. We can try these things first. And if it's not getting better, then, then we can do an antibiotic. Um, it, it's become more common practice for people to include a probiotic with an antibiotic. The latest research shows if you give a probiotic a couple hours away from um, an antibiotic, maybe two hours after, then that's the most effective. And so you're putting back in some of the good bacteria while you're killing it essentially with, with the antibiotic. And I usually use Claire, uh, that's my favorite brand, but there's a ton of different great ones out there. And most people in my practice will come in and say, oh, I have these probiotics at home, are those okay? And for the most part, they're, they're pretty good. It's, it's one of those very benign type of uh, supplements. And so there's a ton of good companies out there. So there was a case recently of a, a baby. I saw them at about four months and they had been in the conventional system seeing a conventional pediatrician for a while and the child was having bad reflux. Um, it started around two months of age and so the reflux was getting worse. So they started on one prescription. It wasn't getting better so they got on a second prescription and they had done all this medication and were about to go in for a scope uh, with the, the GI stomach doctors and they had come to me and we spent about an hour discussing the case and it turned out that they actually had switched over to formula from breast milk right before this had all started. And one of the obvious big changes would be there's going to be a lot more dairy uh, potentially in the, in the formula because you're going to be using a cow's milk uh, protein formula is going to be the general one that they were using. And no one had really put that together in that timeline. Uh, and we're really thinking about why was the reflux happening? We're just treating the reflux, but it wasn't getting better. And so we switched them off of the, that formula to a uh, no dairy uh, formula, more broken down protein, and the child started getting better. One week, two weeks, three weeks, and by about a month, no more reflux. And they never had to go get the scope. And it was just as simple as thinking about things more holistically and thinking about the root cause. And sometimes, you know, conventional doctors would do the same thing. They would think about the same thing. But I think in integrative medicine, that's the way that we're taught, and especially in functional medicine, the, the training is about thinking about that root cause. That's the first place that I, I go. And in this case, the, the, that training was able to help me push them away from that and avoid some of that conventional medicine. And it's amazing if you don't have to put a scope down your eight, you know, four or five month old baby, then who would want to do that? For me, what I like to do is first start off with a very thorough history. So I send a very long packet to every new family that comes to the office. I try to go back through the entire history, create a timeline, look at the patterns and the connections, and try to see um, whether everything makes sense or whether there's other things that we can maybe glean from that history that somebody didn't necessarily fully look into or just kind of forgot about because it happened eight years ago and maybe you switched you know, three different doctors from then and, and that, that fact wasn't even thought about, but it could be connected to what's going on and then sit down with the family, try to do a long consult, half hour, an hour with them, and just go through this and discuss it and try to get a sense of what's going on with that patient. And again, that goes back to the individualized medicine and trying to create a specific plan for this family. And when it comes to functional medicine, we really go back to what are the basic, simple lifestyle factors that you can 
alter. And for most people, there are a few simple things that you can do. It doesn't matter whether you have money, whether you don't have money, wherever you are, that you can make these small changes and you're going to see some impact. I have found that the easiest thing to deal with would be gut issues because usually that's connected to the way that we're eating and our diet and if you alter the diet just a little bit if you maybe cut out gluten and dairy or you do some sensitivity or allergy testing and figure out what you're allergic to and you take that out of the diet then usually you get better fairly quickly but it's not always that easy it's it's very case by case uh, and what do we see most often ADHD autism chronic disease like allergies and stomach issues lupus and arthritis uh, Crohn's things like that it's unbelievably scary how much more common these things are uh, than they used to be. And especially we were talking about autism. The statistics were five, 10 years ago was one in 10,000, maybe more than that. And now it's one in 60. So that's a big, it's a big difference in just a few years. And, and those numbers are predicted to go to one in four or five. If we keep going at this rate, the next 10, 20 years, which is alarmingly scary and there's something going on it's hard to say what and we don't know what the cause is at this point but that rate of increase is scary and yes you can say okay we're a little bit better at diagnosing it but there's no way it's just about how much better we are at diagnosing it because it's not even something you really heard when we were kids and now it's so common just like allergies you know, maybe the odd person you hear about a peanut allergy but now every school everywhere there's so much peanut allergy you just can't bring peanuts anymore which is which is scary why did that happen what did we do what has changed in our environment that's causing this to occur because it didn't just happen. Something is causing inflammation. It's hard to say what. I think it's very unfortunate that there are kind of two camps. There's this integrative world and there's the allopathic uh, Western medicine world and they're so far apart at this point. And I think we have to start working together. Um, I don't think that we know exactly what's causing it, but logically and my personal opinion is it's just a mix of different things there's something in the environment maybe multiple things in the environment there are things that we're doing maybe it's the food that we're eating maybe it's something in the water that we're drinking maybe it's something that we're deficient in probably it's all of those things and autism has really become a catch-all term for these neurological issues but it's probably 5 10 20 50 different things that all just get categorized as autism because that's what we understand as a term and that's what you can you put on for insurance and that's what schools understand so it kind of gets categorized under that but what is causing this this to occur it's really hard to say i don't think we know but my gut is it's something with the environment it's something that we're doing something that's going on in pregnancy something that we're missing from our diets hard to say maybe all of them asthma is really in that spectrum of inflammation allergies that we're seeing so much more frequently almost every other kid has asthma these days and the question is is why what is going on what is causing this body inflammation to occur and in the conventional world what you would do for that is you would treat with steroids because it works it calms down inflammation but then why are we getting this inflammation what is causing it yes the steroids help you but it's not preventing it from occurring and it's not in any way thinking about why this child is having these symptoms and so in the integrative world we try to work on calming down that inflammation uh, before it occurs. So is there something that we're eating in our diet that's causing us to have increased inflammation in our body, which leads to when you get a virus, your body just can't handle the virus, so then you have asthma symptoms. Is it something that we're breathing, some sort of chemical that's causing chronic inflammation in your chest, and then as soon as something else happens, you just can't handle it anymore. In the functional medicine world, there's a really great analogy of the bucket and there's water streaming into the bucket and there's a hole at the bottom of the bucket. And then um, if everything's okay, the water's able to flow through. But if you have something going on, some sort of inflammation, some sort of problem, that bucket starts to fill up. And then another problem happens, more water spills in and you just can't handle it and then it overflows. And I think that's a really good analogy and model for what's going on with allergies and asthma is we just have this overflow of inflammation or the water in the bucket and we just can't handle it. And we get one more thing that happens and then it just spills over. And so if we can decrease that inflammation, that water in the bucket, then we're going to prevent them from getting sick. And that's what I see with my patients is if we do some allergy testing and we take out some of the things that causes that inflammation, the frequency of time that they get these asthma exacerbations starts to decrease, and then it gives enough chance for the lungs to heal, and then it just goes away over time. It's no magic, it's just long-term treatment versus short-term giving a steroid because you're 
decreasing what the body is naturally trying to do. Your body is very intelligent. Children's bodies are very intelligent and it's increasing your histamine levels for a reason. Why is, why is this happening? Why are you, when you get an allergy, your histamine goes crazy and you get hives and a rash? Your body is trying to do something. It's trying to expel a toxin. And then we're giving a steroid, which is calming that down, which I get because when your kid is really sick, you want to do something, you want that to go away. But the question really needs to be, why is this happening and how can we prevent it? Or how can we cure it in the future? And we don't know that yet because that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at treating the symptoms which to me is not where we need to be focusing on. I use all conventional treatment because at the end of the day, when there's a child going through an asthma exacerbation, that's life-threatening and you need to treat that and you want them to get better. And again, these medicines are phenomenal and they're great for acute illness. If your child is having an asthma exacerbation, you can't do something that's gonna take two years for them to get better because this problem didn't just happen today, it's happened over year so it takes a long time to heal that but you need to heal them today when they're right in the middle of that exacerbation and so the steroids are an amazing treatment and when used appropriately that's what they're here for that's what they were invented for and they can save your child and so if somebody comes into me with an exacerbation of course i use all regular medication but then after that fact then we start to look into why did this occur and what can we do to try to prevent it in the future steroids suppress your immune system so a lot of children that will be Taking these chronically will have chronic infections. The infections will get worse. Any medication that you take, your body gets tolerant to it. And so they stop working and you have to take more and more. And every medication has side effects. It's different in most people, but uh, from gut issues to changing your gut flora to stomach aches, diarrhea. Um, some people that take steroids chronically uh, have skin issues. So there's, there's a whole list of different uh, issues that you can have from taking a medication long term. But just common sense says anything you're gonna take for years is gonna cause effects. It's gonna cause effects to your growth. It's gonna cause effects to your body. It's gonna change uh, your brain. It's gonna change your chemistry. When you go to a conventional allergist, they'll usually either do a blood test or a skin prick test, and that's IgE antibody. So when you, let's say, take in a peanut, you have an anaphylactic reaction. That's an IgE reaction. It's an immediate, fast, allergic reaction. That's what is known, that's what's been really studied, and that's what most people do. Now there's this new side, and this is a lot where functional medicine comes in, and regular medicine is starting to, to get it and understand it and accept it, but it's still not 100% accepted in conventional Western medicine, and that's the long-term, low-grade chronic sensitivity, and that would be the IgG antibody. So it's a different antibodies, and, and the terminology doesn't really matter that much in terms of which antibodies it is, but it's the sensitivity versus the allergic reaction. And when you have a sensitivity, it's the stomach issues, the constipation, the diarrhea, the pain, and the whole multitude of not this high-grade anaphylaxis where you take something and, and you have an immediate reaction, but you have symptoms over a long term that start to build up. And so that's what the functional medicine doctors tend to be checking, and a lot of Western medicine doctors are checking it to at this point, but there's all these at-home tests. You can go to the Quest or LabCorp and do it, but there's higher level, better testing within the functional medicine. They'll test for more things. They do it on a little bit better specimen. So that's where the, the difference is. Now, how much better is it? That's really up in there. We don't know. I've had very good success with some of these companies and doing some of these tests, but there's not a ton of evidence yet, especially in the Western medical world, that this works or is, is perfect, but at the same time, if we have more information and you see results, then it's worthwhile. And so you just really have to decide on how much you wanna spend, how much you wanna test, and, and go from there. And there's also a, a downside of you don't wanna to test too much, especially for me and kids. I don't like to do blood work unless I absolutely have to. And so unless it's something that's more serious, we usually we'll start without doing any blood work and just do the elimination diet like you said, we'll take out the most common five or six things from their diet for a month or two months and see if it makes a difference. Because if you don't need to do a blood test, then why do it? I try not to poke kids as much as possible. And those tests are expensive. They're very expensive and it's not always needed. So you can usually at home, even if you have no money at all, you don't need to go to a functional medicine doctor. You don't need to spend three or four or $500 on a test. You can just clean up your diet, meaning take out the wheat, take out the dairy, take out the sugar, take out the processed foods, do that first, do it for two months and see if it makes a difference. You can save yourself a lot of money and a lot of time without having any practitioner see you. So the most common companies that are used would be Genova, uh, Cyrex, there's a Viome's a new company. There, there's a whole bunch of different ones, but 
Uh, I tend to use either Cyrex, Genova, or just the LabQuest or LabCore. I try to use people insurance if, if I can, because why go through the other companies unless you need to? Now, it just depends on what the situation is, because if a child is coming into me and they're pretty healthy overall, I'm not going to send them for a $500 test. But if a child is coming into me for a consult and they've seen six different doctors, they've been to a whole bunch of specialists and they've done all the regular stuff, that to me is the time if they want to, to go look into some of these other tests because you may not get the results that you're looking for, but you also might get some more information. When somebody comes in with ADHD or one of these uh, similar issues, it usually depends on what the parent's goals are. Sometimes they'll come in and say, I want to get them off medication, what can we do? And other times they just, they're coming in uh, regularly. So I don't tend to just take kids off of medication. Certainly nothing that would be quick. This is a long-term process, but if that's the goal, then we'll, we'll work towards that over time. Um, I have seen so much more ADHD recently. It's certainly being overdiagnosed. I think it's something that's diagnosed very quickly when there are uh, potentially other things that could be going on. There's lots of research coming out that if schools change up the way that they teach, if they add more recess, um, if they have healthier food, then the rates of ADHD drop. So that's saying that there's something environmental going on that's increasing the hyperactivity in children. We also know for sure that dyes in food cause hyperactivity and that there's been tons of published research, there's been reviews showing that if you take those kind of foods out of the diet, the hyperactivity decreases. So for me, where I always start is with the diet. We always start in the gut, we can clean up the diet, we take out all the processed food, we take out all the sugar, all of the dyes, you shouldn't be eating any of that anyways. But especially for a child with hyperactivity, you take those things out and you might get a 5 or 10% benefit. And there are also studies on uh, supplements like fish oil, uh, and generally you'll see another 5 or 10%. And if you start adding those things in, you get a 20, 30% improvement. And right there, you're already kind of snowballing down the hill into a better direction. And then we'll see, see where we're at from there. And sometimes that's enough improvement where the family's like, hey, you know, maybe we can try coming down on the medication, maybe not off, but if you have a dose of 10 milligrams or something, maybe we can do five milligrams and the kid's doing okay. All right, for another month later, maybe we can go down again. And it just depends on what their goals are. Sometimes, you know, the goal is to decrease the medication and that's great and sometimes it's to come off. But if we can even decrease the dose, that that's a benefit. These are brain altering chemicals and it doesn't mean that sometimes we don't need them some children certainly do and it makes a big difference in their life they're not functioning and then they're able to function on them but you have to know that these affect your neurotransmitters they affect your serotonin they affect your dopamine and if you're replacing that with a pill then you're not producing it yourself and over the long run these pills stop to work you're affecting um, the rest of your body because everything's connected and that certainly can lead to and most research shows that Children that are taking a medication when they're younger are more likely to do drugs when they're older are more likely to take some of these medications when they're older. So there's certainly an effect there. And I think we haven't quite reached the point where we even know what the effect is because it's become so much more common and prevalent recently. So we're going to see the wave of issues potentially five, 10 years from now. I always do everything else possible first unless there's something that's life-threatening. And something like learning that they would be sent over to maybe a specialist to go see. But other than that, if you're coming in and saying, I think my child might have ADHD, my first goal is to rule out everything else medical first, because there are other medical things that can mimic it, like sleep apnea, you can have vitamin deficiencies. So we want to make sure we rule all those things out. And then we'll try all of the other lifestyle factors first. And then if none of that works or it's still causing significant problems, then that's when maybe you go over to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist, you get a full evaluation if they also agree that this is something that would be helpful and you know, mom or dad understands what the side effects are and what the benefits may be and we all agree that it's helpful, then that's great because if, at the end of the day, if a child cannot function at school, then we need to do something. But I don't think medicine should be the first thing. It should be the last thing. There are so many wonderful practitioners out there. There's naturopaths and there's acupuncture and there's all these different things that you can do. And when something is so emotional like that, that may not be my specialty. That may not be exactly what I know. And uh, if that's the case, then I would work with somebody else. I would say, hey, you know, I know this acupuncture, so I think this may really help calm your stress. And if we can improve your stress by 5%, then maybe we can come back and see what else we can do. And maybe there's a, 
a therapist out there that we can send you so you can talk about this and maybe they uncover something and we say, okay, then we send you over here and you try to work back. You do one thing at a time, but you work as a team and that's what medicine is supposed to be. You're supposed to work with people that know better than you and know different fields. And we're pretty good at doing that when it becomes a GI issue, we send to the stomach doctor. When it's a heart issue, we send to the heart doctor. And most people know where all those are, but do you know where your local yoga studio is? Do you know where the closest acupuncture is? Because those things can help too. And so creating that network around you for your patients, that's the best thing that you can do. The microbiome is different in a child that comes from a C-section than one that comes from a vaginal birth. Whether that makes a difference clinically or health-wise is still yet to be seen. We know that children that are breastfed have fewer health complications as they get older. So we think that's important, but there are many children that have formula and they also are very healthy. So I don't think it's as cut and dry as if you you know, have a C-section and you don't do breast milk, you're gonna have health problems later. But I think if those things uh, happen, then you're more of a setup to have health issues later. And so if you start seeing some of these things pop up, that's when you wanna get involved early. And so for those children, you may want to replace with some of the bacteria that we know are more common, like the bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, they're more common in, in babies. And so you can start with some probiotics early, maybe you can add in some vitamin D uh, or other supplements or a multivitamin just to make sure that, that their immune system is working as uh, strongly as it can. And I don't think we have enough information yet on how important and what, what may come from uh, these differences. And I think we need to do more research on that because it's so common we're having C-sections these days. And if there is uh, major health complications that can come from that, people would want to know. We know there are a long list, a longer than I can name, of health benefits from breastfeeding and certainly it helps with your immunity and helps fight off infection. Uh, and it's great for your gut health. So as long as you can go, I think is helpful. Most research shows that the vast majority of the health benefits are if you can make it to six months. So that's what we always aim for, but life uh, throws you curveballs, and some people, uh, some moms, they either lose their breast milk supply or things happen in their life and they just can't get there. So whatever you can do is great. Even if it's one feeding a day for three or four months, that's still better than nothing. Uh, and you, know, you do whatever you can and, and they're, most kids that just have formula turn out fine too. There's no issues with that either. So we just promote what is known from the research to be the healthiest. And so the longer you can go, the better. And we aim for six months to a year. But if people want to go farther or longer, than that, that's great. Uh, when it comes to vaccines, there are really two major camps. You have the, the pediatricians and the healthcare, and it's very pro-vax and everybody vaccinates and, and that's where it is. And then you have the anti-vaxxers on this side and all of vaccines are, are crazy and we, you know, nobody should be vaccinating and they cause all sorts of problems. And we know that neither side is 100% correct. I think we need to work together to make the least impact on children as possible. We know that there were many horrible diseases 20, 30, 50, 100 years ago and some of them have been eradicated. So anybody that says that vaccines don't do any good there's no way that's true, that's, that's not science. But then to also say that there's no possible problems that can come from vaccines, that can't be true either. You take Tylenol, or you take any medication and you can have some, some symptoms. So I think the goal of, of healthcare and integrated practice is we all have to come together and we need to open that dialogue and that discussion back up and create the best vaccines for our children. We need to continue to improve them. Doesn't mean there's any specific issues with them right now. It's hard to say, but we can never say that anything's perfect. We should try to always continue to improve uh, what we have, always look into whether something can be causing an issue. And if that's an issue, then we, we take it off the market. And that does happen sometimes. There are some vaccines that they take off the market because they do cause issues. And so we have to just continue that dialogue and not be on separate camps and not laugh at people when they don't want to vaccinate because we're all on the same team. Doctors, patients, families, have that discussion. And if you don't agree with what your physician says, then find another doctor. But also don't just read uh, some of the blogs on the internet and just take that as, as a gospel because there's a lot of scientific research behind these as well. So I think we need to take both sides and have a good long discussion with your pediatrician. I think it's important not to be too militant about what children eat. I think that's becoming also a big problem. We're moving the other way now for some people. And there's a new issue called orthorexia, which is fear of food. And 
um, if we don't ever allow our kids to eat out with their friends, then they're going to have issues around food, which may cause other problems down the road. And so I think if you're generally healthy, then I tell all my families, you know, if they're at a party and there's a piece of cake or there's something, okay, let them have fun, let them do it. You control what you can control, control what's at home. If you're controlling what they eat 95% of the time, and if they have one piece of, of chocolate or something like that, that's not the one you'd want, that's it, fine. It's not, it, I don't think that's a big issue, which is very different than if you're having a child that's very ill and you're working on a plan like an elimination diet then you need to stick with that and do it 100% of the time for that month or two months while you're trying to heal the gut. And so for me, it's only that militant when you're working on something. If you have someone who's very sick and you're trying to create a plan, then we need you to be uh, militant about this, uh, this plan for a couple months and let things heal, and then you can go back to slowly eating those things again. But for the average kid, if they're at a party, let them have fun. If you can handle it, if it causes you to have a little bit of stomach ache and it's worthwhile to the child, then you know, it's fine, but if it causes you to get really sick, then no, you wouldn't do it. It's the same thing as a peanut. You know, if, if, if it's going to cause you anaphylaxis, then you're never, you're going to eat it. You're going to avoid it the rest of your life. But if it's not causing a major issue, then you just weigh the pros and the cons. And if, you know, it's some ice cream and you get a little bit of stomach ache, then that's up to each parent and each kid. And usually as the kids get older, they hopefully internalize this and they start avoiding those foods that make them feel ill and that's the benefit of doing it this way is to teach them about the differences and teach them about their body so that they understand how they're supposed to feel how healthy feels and if they don't feel that way when they eat this food don't eat it for me why i do integrated pediatrics because it's changing the future generations that's that's our goal is for them to learn about this and internalize it and change their future practices because as we were mentioning before with all these chronic illnesses something is doing that and we need to change our habits and we need our children to change what they're doing and to internalize what healthy food is versus what not so healthy food is because when they go off to college your mom and dad aren't going to be there and if they're eating at the cafeteria and eating you know, pizza and pasta and hamburgers every day all those issues are going to come back so if, if they've understood what it means and they understand what a healthy diet is and how that can affect them then hopefully they'll make those healthy choices on their own and push their friends to also make healthier choices and that's how we make a real change.